What's up guys, it's Marius from Audio Judgment and today we're gonna talk about crossovers. So, is it difficult to design a passive crossover? Well, if you do it the wrong way, then no. No, it's not difficult. However, if you want to do it the correct way, it's a pretty elaborate process, so stick around to see what I'm talking about. Let's say you want to design a two-way crossover and you have no idea what you're doing. What do you do? You go to Google like any other normal person. So you search for crossover calculator. And what do you know is the first link. So we have a two-way crossover calculator. So what do I understand from this is that we need the impedance of the drivers and the crossover point. So simple enough. Let me stop you right there. What's the problem with this type of calculator? It assumes that the speaker has a fixed resistance value. So in these calculators you basically enter the nominal impedance of the drivers. So if we take a random one just for example, we can see that this one has the nominal impedance of 8 ohms. But if we actually look at uh, the impedance graph, we can see that it's all over the place because impedance changes with the frequency. If this chart uh, would have looked like a flat line on 8 ohms, then these uh, calculators uh, might work. Ish. Kinda. So here's what we'll do. I've been working on an MTM floor standing speaker and I have everything set up for measurement. So we get the mic at one meter distance and uh, there we have our prototype enclosure which is uh, elevated a bit from the ground so we can delay the earliest reflection since uh, the port is uh, pretty close uh, to the floor. Now if we go to the back we can see that we have two sets of terminals. So uh, the top one goes to the tweeter and the bottom one goes to the base drivers which are wired in a parallel. Further back I have a small table where we can assemble different prototype crossovers. We are going to measure them and see how they perform. So first of all we are going to check how well the crossover calculator performs. We are going to take those numbers, build a prototype crossover and see how does it measure. So here's the deal. So we have a Morel Cat 408 tweeter which has an impedance of 8 ohms. We also have uh, two woofers, two SAS uh, CA18 RNX and these have 8 ohm each so uh, the resulting impedance will be 4 ohms since we are going to wire them in parallel. The crossover frequency will be at uh, 2500 Hertz because uh, that is the crossover frequency of the correct crossover and I'm going to use uh, the same frequency in this calculator. And the crossover type is a third order because uh, this is an MTM Dapolito design and we want to benefit from that the uniform vertical sound dispersion. Okay, let's punch in the numbers. So we have 8 ohm tweeter, 4 ohm bass drivers and the crossover frequency 2500. And the crossover type will be third order Butterworth. And click calculate. And there we have our component values. So let's build the prototype and measure it to see how it performs.
So if you are curious of uh, what I was doing before this, uh, in short, I apply the uh, time window to the response curve and we basically lose the low frequency response and instead we gain an anechoic response of the speaker for the rest of the frequencies. So uh, it is the compromise we have to make because we are measuring inside a normal room and not an anechoic chamber. But we are interested only in this area anyway, so we want to see what the crossover is doing. And it's doing pretty bad, as you can see. Only if you look uh, at, uh, uh, at the, this um, uh, information right here. So we have at uh, 2000 Hertz, we have uh, 60 decibels. And at 4000, we have uh, 45. So uh, the 15 decibels uh, difference between uh, uh, any frequencies is uh, a no-go. So this crossover design is pretty poor. As we saw, you can get very bad results from these calculators. If you're lucky, the response curve can look a bit better. Anyway, let me show you how to do it the correct way. Now, I'm not going to teach you the exact process because it will take like eight hours or so, but you can check two of my courses if you really want to learn on how to build uh, crossovers. So instead, I'm going to show you a step-by-step -step process with small descriptions of what I'm doing. And I will not be explaining everything. I'm just giving you the bigger picture on how to design crossovers. So enjoy.
Now it is evident that this uh, uh, crossover is much much better than the previous one. Uh, the response is uh, pretty much flat. So if we strike a line through here, we can see that the response goes uh, plus minus two decibels, maybe plus minus two decibels, which is which is pretty good. And besides the frequency response, we also need to have a phase agreement between the drivers. So that's why you saw me um, inverting the polarity of a speaker. So this is the, uh, the response with one speaker out of phase, and you have to have a big null. This means uh, the drivers perfectly cancel each other out. So when you switch the polarity, they are in perfect phase. So that is uh, Im important as well. And this uh, dip over here dictates the crossover frequency. So the crossover frequency is, is uh, somewhere at uh, 2400 hertz. So as we saw from this video, crossover design is not that easy. You need measurement equipment to, to measure the drivers in your exact enclosure. Baffle shape and size will significantly affect the frequency response as a result of diffraction. So if you plan in downloading frequency response files for your particular drivers, it won't work because those measurements are made in a half space and therefore no diffraction. Anyway, I hope I shed some light on this uh, crossover design process. So don't forget to subscribe if you want to see more videos like this and see you in the next one. Peace.